Want to see art happening in Wisconsin? On this episode of the Arts Page, watch a Milwaukee area painter's process for creating portraits. Enjoy the Wisconsin Philharmonic as they paint pictures with music. And see Downton Abbey on display at an Oshkosh landmark. That's all coming up now on the Arts Page. Welcome to the Arts Page. I'm your host, Sandy Max. Wisconsin inspires artists with beautiful scenery and interesting people, and it serves as a creative space to showcase artistic works. Milwaukee area painter Brian Keither is well known for his wildlife art. And with an intense attention to detail, Keither also applies this same focus to some famous and fascinating faces. You know, the, the thing with portraits is the smallest amount that you're off is going to make a huge difference. My name is Brian Keither and I'm a fine artist. I got started doing portraits because I always liked seeing the different personalities, the old characters, and I just tried to capture that. If I could get somebody to walk in and, and tell what that person character and personality was like, then, you know, it was successful. I just enjoyed trying to convey that personality. Well, you have to study the face. You have to figure out what stands out the most, what you see first, and basically is what I'd like to do is start with the eyes and work around the eyes. The eyes are probably 85% of it. You work in, you know, your mouth, your nose, and where the eyebrows lie and all of that. The more reference material you have, the better. It's tough to get somebody to sit still for so long, so you're gonna start with a rough sketch and then you're gonna go in and refine it. You know, sometimes you have to rely on photos and use your best knowledge. If it's just the face that intrigues me, then I'm, I'm gonna do just the face. Sometimes I like to keep it loose. The looser it is, I think the more, the more life it has, especially working with oil paint, you, you have the ability to go in and keep it very loose and, and lifelike. You can't just do Aaron Rodgers as a portrait because he is a very diverse guy. I had to find elements and images that worked with him. Winners never quit after uh, Vince Lombardi, who's up in the top left. I, th I had to include him in there. I have Aaron in the front with more detail on it just because it stands out that much more. And in the background, I've got uh, him on the right-hand side looking relaxed and happy. So I wanted to show him without the helmet on. MVP, two times MVP. The stadium, of course, and I've got his autograph. So it seemed to somewhat personalize it. The elements I found seem to work with it. People know him best as a quarterback. So that, the stadium, and, and everything else in there all seem to uh, relate well with each other. I generally use mostly oil paints. I like to glaze, and uh, I'll rough out a piece and uh, just go in and tack it with paint. A lot of times I'll just mix paint right on the canvas, get a feel for where it's going, and then I go in and I glaze it and uh, detail it as I'm working it through. I kept mostly local color. I've got some impressionistic type of paint in there as well on both sides of it, which, which is nice. And then I've got the realism in the, in the front, in the foreground that pops Aaron forward. So he's the main character. Aaron just seems to have his act together. He's a great role model. He's given everybody in, in Wisconsin and all of his fans around the country uh, so much to uh, be happy about. I've done a number of holiday cards and uh, the illustrations and small pieces like that are nice because they have a lot of character in them and I just always wanted to do something like that too since early on. Children are always on the move and, and they have such a great personality and of course being my children, it's, I was destined to paint their portraits so I have them on quite a few portraits. 
I don't try to belabor it. I, I just try to do the best I can. You really have to get in their head and, and once you can um, understand their personality and how they think and, and you're able to translate that onto canvas, it's, it's great. You have to keep a person's interest in a painting. You have to keep his, their eyes rotating throughout the painting. I don't like it just stagnant and stiff. So if, if they can smile and enjoy it and say, hey, you know, I, I can really relate to that, that's, that's super, that's great. Everybody has their own personality and, and trying to get um, that relayed on canvas is difficult, but I don't mind the challenge. I know I'm in for the long haul. <laughs> it's very challenging. So it's great when it turns out. You may have seen Brian Keither's art before on Milwaukee Public Television. He's a two-time featured artist for the Great TV Auction. See a variety of Brian Keither's works at his website, briankeitherartstudios.com. From portraits to music that paints a picture, the Wisconsin Philharmonic is a community treasure. It provides cultural and educational opportunities for people in the Waukesha area through music. The Wisconsin Philharmonic celebrated the end of their latest season with their annual family concert. Music paints a picture, but it paints a picture in tones that we as people then interpret in our own minds, that it is really from the heart to the heart via this language of sound. The Wisconsin Philharmonic began almost 70 years ago. We were founded in 1947 as the Waukesha Symphony Orchestra, as we're based here in Waukesha County. It was actually a gift to the community by the president of what was then Carroll College, who thought that a live classical music orchestra would be a good addition to not only the college, but to the community. As things have progressed, our audience and our musicians come from a wide swath of southeastern Wisconsin. So we, several years ago, decided to change the name to Wisconsin Philharmonic because we're all part of this wonderful southeastern Wisconsin, greater Milwaukee area. And one of the great things about the Wisconsin Philharmonic is that we create concerts in which we are everything from a small group of say a couple dozen musicians playing in a beautiful, historic, intimate space, or as today, we're, we're just under about a hundred musicians on stage. So one of the beautiful things about the Philharmonic is its flexibility. We play five official season concerts, and then two years ago, we added the family concert. We were thinking of ways to build the audience of the future. We realized it was long overdue that the Philharmonic present a true family concert, a concert intended for families, intended for young audiences in which people can just learn about the basic rudiments of this glorious thing we call classical music. But also be a concert in which we could have on stage some of the finest young musicians from our own community, from this Waukesha County, southeastern Wisconsin community, playing side by side with our seasoned professional musicians. This past 2014-2015 season of the Philharmonic was devoted to the music of Scandinavia. For our our annual family concert, what better music to perform than some of the most beautiful moments from the music that the great Norwegian composer Edvard Grieg wrote for Ibsen's play Peer Gint, the Peer Gint Suites. We're playing these wonderful short works that Grieg wrote for, for Peer Gint uh, in the context of a narration which is based on the theme, on the idea that music can paint a picture. We precede the concert with the instrument petting zoo. And that is the 
opportunity for young children to experience all manner of instruments. You know, blow the horn, play the violin, have fun experiencing instruments. The, the children appreciate being allowed to touch these things because so often it's don't touch, but they love being able to touch that. Music gives you the easel and you paint the picture yourself. Strings, come on down. The audience is basically going to find out or be reminded of what makes up a symphony orchestra because a symphony orchestra really is like a large extended family with its own different sections and subsections. There is a string section, for example, which is the largest section of the symphony orchestra, instruments like violins and violas and cellos. And then there's a woodwind section like flutes and clarinets, brass section, trumpets, trombones, a percussion section, drums, the harp. Our orchestra is made up of a wonderful, wonderful group of veteran professional musicians. And this kind of concert where all of our musicians are going to be seated literally side by side with brilliant young players who are just beginning their journey of discovery of this beautiful thing called music, that it really is a case of everyone being enriched by this collective experience. And then afterwards, we will have a very short performance by El Sistema, which is an international children's group that brings classical music to young children. And there is only one chapter in the state of Wisconsin, and that's here in Waukesha. I'm looking for a collective expression. I'm looking for all of the musicians of the orchestra to express themselves through the music as individuals, but in a way that's harmonious, in a way that's part of the whole. And that's where playing classical music, that's where performing and, and listening to symphony orchestras really is the school for life, because a successful orchestra is truly a, a collection of successful individuals who at once act as leaders and also act as members of a team. My favorite part of being a music director for this group or any group is really creating something special in performance. Those moments in the music that you never expected would happen, but again, through the genius of the creativity of all the individuals in front of you playing together, suddenly just come alive, suddenly just happen. That, it's for those moments that I'm, I'm the music director. The feedback has been terrific because it's opened up a whole world that these children might not have been exposed to, and the parents either. Classical music is, is a treasure. It is not something to be afraid of, but also feeling that this is a wonderful avenue for their children to know and experience and hopefully become the audience of the future. And last but not least, the bassoon. Music is one of the miracles of humanity. The way that one person cre can create a great work of music and then share that creation in a way that that can just can happen in the context of a live performance that is created, it happens, and then it's over. And in a sense, it's gone forever. That essential mystery is what I would want every concert goer to come away with at every concert they attend. The Wisconsin Philharmonic also offers Music for the Future, educational outreach programs that reach more than 1,500 students each year through classical music mentorship and performance. Learn more about the Wisconsin Philharmonic's educational efforts and upcoming performances on their website, wisphil.org. 
Oshkosh, Wisconsin, has the honor of being one of the first stops of a new touring exhibit, Spotlighting Downton Abbey, the hit PBS masterpiece series that has become a phenomenon. Downton Abbey follows the story of the aristocratic Crawley family and their servants in England during the early 20th century. A captivating collection of costumes from the TV show is on display at the Payne Art Center and Gardens. From the Dowager's hat to Anna Bates's apron, the evening dresses to the uniforms, let us give you a personal tour inside Dressing Downton, Changing Fashion for Changing Times. The buzz or the anticipation for this show has been greater than any we have ever done in the past. So the fans are avid, they are willing to drive, the costumes are gorgeous, and the whole exhibition really focuses on placing those costumes within their historical context and then bringing them to life. The Payne Art Center and Gardens in Oshkosh is an English-style country estate that was built by Nathan and Jesse Kimberly Payne in the 1920s, and we have been open to the public since 1948 as an art museum, historic estate, and botanical garden. Summer 2015 at the Payne, we are featuring Dressing Downton, Changing Fashion for Changing Times. And it's a fantastic exhibition of 36 costumes from the period drama, Downton Abbey, which is a PBS masterpiece series. It's put together by Exhibits Development Group out of St. Paul, Minnesota. And they have worked with Cosprop, which is the costume house in London that provides many of the costumes for Downton Abbey. We have 36 costumes from seasons one through four of the television series, and it shows fashions and how they changed from 1912, when the series began with the sinking of the Titanic, through World War I and into the 1920s and the Jazz Age. When visitors enter the exhibition, they enter through the main gallery first, and in the main gallery, we have about a third of the 36 costumes on view, and they are accompanied by beautiful, large-scale film still photo murals. So they show the scene in which the costume was worn by the actor, and visitors can go through the different costumes. They're also accompanied by signs, which tell the importance of the fashion, the importance of the costume, or the scene that it was worn in. And they really are fantastic accompaniments that bring all of these scenes back to life for the avid viewer of Downton Abbey. And then once they leave the main gallery, they will visit the period rooms of the Payne Mansion. And in all of the period rooms, there are costumes. The mansion was never lived in by the Payne family. So it's the first time really the rooms have come to life. They now have inhabitants. And the costume placements within the period rooms were chosen for a reason. They complement the decor, or the purpose of the room. And so it's a really fun way to walk through and envision the Payne Mansion as if it were Highclere Castle and the fictional Downton Abbey. Viewers can really get up close and see all of that amazing handwork that is done for these costumes. So the lace, the embroidery, the beadwork, it's all hand-sewn details. So you can actually look and linger rather than just trying to catch a one second frame on TV. The fashions in Downton Abbey in seasons one through four go through a dr dramatic shift. What was happening between 1912 and the 1920s in terms of fashion and hemlines and silhouettes. You go from that Edwardian period and very formal and or, ornate. And then World War I occurs, 1914 to 1918, and it lessens the formality of the clothing worn by these aristocratic families. 
the Crawley daughters in the series. They were, you know, the daughters of the Earl of Grantham, yet they're going to work during World War I. Sybil is a nurse, and Downton Abbey becomes an infirmary for wounded soldiers, so she works as a nurse, and you see that costume. You also see Lady Edith, who worked as a land girl, helping some of the tenant farmers on the estate, and you see her outfit and her wonderful bicycle. And you also see a shortening of hemlines starting to come up. So there's a lot of change that takes place. And then by the time you get into the 1920s, the silhouette has completely transformed. You either have a dropped waist or no waistline at all. It's a completely straight silhouette with a boyish look. Then you get to the flapper period, and it's a lot more bare and exposed. You're showing a lot more ankle and lower leg and also the arms. So it's just a more, greater freedom and independence for the time period. My favorite character is the one played by Maggie Smith, the Dowager Countess, Lady Violet. This lilac dress is worn during her kind of mid-range mourning period after her relatives had perished in the sinking of the Titanic. It's very traditional, it's very Edwardian. It has the bustle and then the S shape of the corset. It really captures the essence of her character. We have very fine clothing worn by the men of the house, Matthew Crawley and the Earl of Grantham white tie dinner wear. We also have military costumes. They were based on historical reference material. Also hunting outfits and outfits used for leisure, you know, walking and hiking on the estate. And they're in fine country tweeds. We have the downstairs staff represented by three costumes in the exhibition. We have a footman in the dining room, which is very appropriate. We also have in our upstairs dressing room, which would have been Mrs. Payne's dressing room, we have on view a beautiful evening gown worn by Lady Mary Crawley, and then the costume of her lady's maid, Anna, who's one of the most beloved characters. Her maid's costume is shown, and she's actually dressing Mary in the dressing room. We also have the character of Mrs. Hughes, the housekeeper, and we have that costume on view in our own servants' quarters. We never had a staff at the Payne Mansion since it was never inhabited. Mrs. Hughes is our first servant at the Payne Mansion. We have her set up with a desk in the back servants' hallway. It's a real variety that you can see in the exhibition, both with men's costumes and women's. The props are a really important aspect so that it's not just a rigid mannequin in a costume. They really do make it more real for the viewer and are a terrific enhancement. We have five costumes on view in the Great Hall and the room itself is a magnificent prop for the costumes. We have our Persian silk rug out, we have our grand piano out. Those characters all look like they're having a great party in the middle of our great hall. The Payne is very excited to be the only Wisconsin venue for this traveling exhibition. When you're having an exhibition that extends beyond just the main gallery and goes into the rooms, viewers have a much greater appreciation for the settings and how it all fits together in a cohesive experience. There's still time to see Dressing Downton, Changing Fashion for Changing Times, on display now until September 20th, 2015 at the Payne Arts Center and Gardens in Oshkosh. Find all the information to plan your visit at the website, thepain.org. For more information on this week's features, visit our website at mptv.org and click on the Arts page. Or like us on Facebook at the Arts page to get regular artist updates and join our conversations there. On the next episode of the Arts page, discover unique artistic creations like the Coles Color Wheels art projects, the art of money, and charcoal drawings that bring nature to life. 
I'm Sandy Max. Thank you for watching, and please join us next time on the Arts Page.